Hi, this is Courtney Hale, and I'm here with Patricio Dominguez, and it's my pleasure to have the opportunity to ask you some questions. Um, so question number one is, um, who are you, and what is your background with Native American relations and environment? Wow. Okay. Um, <laughs> I am an unstoppable force that is limited only by my vision, and my vision is for freedom, justice, and happiness for all my relations. And my name is Patricio. How's that for a thumbnail sketch? That ought to, that ought to wow them out there in, <laughs> in the world. That, that's quite an opening line. <laughs> 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 I'm not sure where to go from there. Um, <laughs> maybe if we could talk a little bit about your expertise around environmental issues and your nonprofit and the seed sovereignty work. Okay. Um, since about 1985, I have been involved in uniting, uh, uniting the medicine people of the tribes uh, it was based around a prophecy that had been in uh, in the air for maybe, gosh, you know, three, four hundred years, maybe, but it didn't become real active until about the 1900s, and there was this prophecy about the return of the eagle and the condor, and that someday that the eagle and condor would fly together once again. In 1985, and that was uh, somewhere around the, uh, the convergence uh, that uh, that convergence movement uh, happened that then people started talking seriously about the Eagle Condor thing. And I got involved in that in, at that time. And I wound up uh, being a uh, coordinator for North American natives to bring the uh, Eagle aspect together with the Condor. There was a, a couple of coordinators. There was uh, actually three coordinators. There was a coordinator for South America, there was a coordinator for North America and a coordinator for Central America, and I wound up being the, uh, the, the go-to guy for North America. And it was my job, of course, to try and get some, uh, some participation from North American elders to join into uh, a, a serious meeting and uh, an organization that would uh, bring the medicine people of the North, the Eagles, and the medicine people of the South, and of course, no one's going to be left behind, so Central America had to be thrown in there, and so the uh, Quetzal got thrown in, so uh, it later became Eagle Condor Quetzal uh, Gathering, and its intention really was to bring together the medicine people to kind of uh, work out the, uh, the future of the, um, of the spiritual uh, world for Native people in the, uh, in the coming years. And that was in the 1900s or what they call the 20th century. Now we're in the 21st century and things are pretty much uh, already on their way. Uh, we, are, we have a lot of work to do, obviously, but uh, things are, are coming together. In fact, actually, the meeting that's happening over in, um, in um, Standing Rock is actually a very real uh, manifestation of the Eagle Condor and uh, Quetzal coming together. We have tribes from both Central, North, and South America working together for a cause. Now, this was always uh, this was always the issue. It was to get people. It was get people together working together so that once again the old trade routes and the old conscious uh, exchange between the North, the South, and the Center would happen again. You know, a a, a uh, an invader came along, broke up the, the uh, communication lines, and so things went into a stagnation. But now, now we have a bona fide situation where things are being done. Let me backtrack just a little bit. The Eagle Condor Quetzal gatherings were about creating a structure for just this kind of thing. At that point in time, it was only theoretical. We wanted to create an uh, a structure to handle, because we knew in the future there would be challenges, but we wanted to create a structure to handle these challenges when they came forward. 
Now, the structure never really did form. There was no uh, united uh, organization of medicine people from North, South, and Central America, even though we were worked it very hard from 1985 to the present. That no formal structure ever was formed. However, the issue seemed to have formed the organization. So, you know, maybe we were trying to put the cart before the horse. Who knows? Anyway, the horse or the cart, whatever it is, showed up in the form of a threat to the people. There was a tribe that needed help to defend their livelihood and their lives. They had a situation where they wanted to protect their the water in in their in their area. And suddenly there was an outpouring from the other tribes because it was the issue that touched on every, on all levels. There was no people, no tribe in Central or South America that could be without clean water. And they had been facing this before. Only the tribes of the North didn't quite get involved because the U.S. government kind of kept it hidden from them that these issues were going on. But when a North American tribe got threatened, suddenly, you know, it became big enough news that the other tribes in South America, Central America, started, said, we're going to support North America. And they sent their representatives. And this made all the difference. Now there is an actual gathering for a real physical purpose of the eagle, the condor, and the quetzal. So I see this as a fulfillment of that prophecy that had been floating around for hundreds of years. And so this is, this is really, really special. So I've been involved in this my whole, my whole adult life. Well, uh, not my whole adult life, actually. It started in 1985. I was born in 1949. So, you know, it, uh, but a good chunk of my life has been involved in this process. And so I'm going to continue to be involved in this process by doing these kind of things where I talk about the past, where it, where it came from, and maybe a little bit of where we are and uh, further into the future and, um, and, every, and all the issues related to that. Does that answer your question? That's an amazing answer to the question. Um, I didn't see that coming. <laughs> I knew all that information, but I hadn't really thought about Standing Rock in that context. So that's pretty amazing. Um, it's real. So, I mean, the next, yeah, it is for real. Um, I was even there. Um, and, and to see all of those flags together on the main drag is amazing. You know, the flags from all the different nations, all the different people. So um, it's like the UN of, of Native Americans. Yeah. Right. It, it is the eagle, the quetzal, and the condor flying together. And even though they, we never really established a headquarters like the United Nations, we, we have. You know, it, it's a tent city right now, but, you know, it isn't the physical structure that, that matters. It's the, the, the spiritual structure that matters. And then the issue. So we have a real spiritual structure and even though it's made, you know, it, it, the physical structure is tense, it doesn't matter. The prayers are happening in all the languages, and it's real. It, you know, anybody, as you said, you, you, I was there, I saw it, I touched it, I felt it, I smelled it, uh, you know, I tasted it. It, 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 was, it was tangible. And this is what we are wait, have been waiting for, and it's now real and happening. By the way, how did it taste? <laughs> um, actually, the food tasted really good. I, I want to compliment the chefs out there. <laughs> and I'm, I'm sure that they're going to have even tastier food come spring because they're composting. I was walking around the camp and I was shocked. It was like, oh my Lord, these people are so brilliant. They're even composting in the middle of all of this, right? They Excellent. haven't lost their focus on, you know, caring for the earth. So it's pretty amazing. Um, so uh, I was... I was going to ask you about the historic significance of the events at Standing Rock, and I think you kind of led into that. Um, I was thinking a lot about uh, Wounded Knee, and I was thinking about Ghost Dance and, and those old prophecies about the, the return of the old ways, the, the Buffalo people. Um, 
when Wawoka was praying for the return of the buffalo, was he being literal? Because we did see the buffalo running through camp, so that's good. But was there an, another level to the, uh, the prayers? Are we waiting for the return of someone? Yes, we are. In fact, actually, we are, we are waiting on all of those levels. We are re re waiting for the return of the physical buffalo, and we're re waiting for the return of the spiritual buffalo. Actually, the return of the physical buffalo was to verify the fact that there has been a return of the, of the spiritual buffalo. Now, Wavoka was praying for the return of the people. Actually, he was being a little bit even more specific. He was praying for the return, and not just him, but his whole movement was praying for the return of the ancestors. So Wavoka's tribe was praying, and all the other tribes that were taken up by the movement were praying for the same thing, the return of the ancestors. Now, you got to remember that in this part of the world, in North America, there was millions of Native Americans prior to 1492. It was shortly after that that their numbers diminished incredibly because things were introduced that diminished those numbers. You know, outright aggression and uh, an effort to destroy. And then there was the biological warfare that um, nobody anticipated, basically diseases and uh, perdition by uh, loss of habitat and all of that caused millions of Native Americans to die off. And so this was what Voca and all the other tribes were praying for. They wanted all those millions to come back. Now, as a Native American, I know that prayers are never lost. Prayers might take time to fulfill, but they are never lost. So what we're seeing now is the fulfillment of those prayers. The ancestors have come back. Now, they didn't come back the way the tribal people wanted them to come back. They wanted them to come back in their families and in their tribes and in their, you know, and in their uh, little, in their little reservation situations and all that. But that was impossible. Millions of souls were out there wanting to come back, and they did. And they came back in bodies that were not quite as brown and red as they used to be, but the heart and the soul, the spirit of these of these individuals is right there. So you actually have present at Standing Rock and other places in this country, Native American ancestors wearing slightly less tan, but just as beautiful bodies as were here back in 1491. This is a wonderful, wonderful time. All those beautiful white people that have joined the, their brown and red brothers in the process are exactly what Wovoka and those tribes were praying for, the return of their, of their ancestors. And just like, just like, their, just like their, their ancestors, they're standing by them and standing with them and supporting their cause because they are connected on a profound level. They are connected spiritually. They're not just connected by, by some superficial feeling or emotion. They really, really want to be like their, like their, their, uh, like their press. I mean, like their, um, their, their successors. I mean, they want to rejoin the tribes. They want to rejoin that lifestyle and they're doing everything they can to do it by helping the helping the original people retain their ways. And that is their way in. Because if there are no ancient ways to preserve, if there is no, if there is no culture to join, then they, their mission is lost. So they have a real stake in this. They have to make Standing Rock work so that they can join the tribe once again and be part of that family and that culture that they long to be a part of. But they're there. They're every, all, all, mil, all million and a half or 10 million. I don't remember what the numbers were. They were huge. But they're all here. You're all here. And welcome, welcome to, the, uh, to the effort. And uh, if, if we are successful 
if you help us, your, your brothers and sisters, your, your deepest dreams, your deepest spiritual yearnings can be fulfilled. A life that you left behind somewhat involuntarily many decades ago will once again come back to you and you can rejoin and enjoy that wonderful way of life. This is what uh, is it? This is what's happening right now. I hope that answers your question. That answers the question, and then some. Um, there have been, you know, some kind of negative Nellies sometimes who are uh, saying that this is a Native American issue, and that they don't need outsiders' help, and that uh, you know the people who are showing up are are muddying the waters. And um, I think that this is an issue that's important to all people, right? I mean, I don't understand how this could not affect all people, whether we're the ancestors reincarnate or not. Um, everyone drinks water. Water is life. So how can this not affect all people? Correct. The, the issue is, the issue cuts across all boundaries, but um, some of the Native Americans don't remember and, you know, because a, a deliberate attempt to stifle the memory of what they, what they were trying to do. You know, some of those people out there at Standing Rock don't remember that they prayed for this, for this help. They prayed for this situation. They just don't remember it. Maybe because it wasn't them exactly. It was their grandparents or maybe their parents that did it, most likely their grandparents, because Wovoka and the, uh, the ghost dance was about two generations ago. And they, and, you know, and, and, and it's not talked about very much, and certainly the, the real meaning of it has been somewhat suppressed. But Native America has to wake up to the fact that they asked for this. I mean, in a, in a good way, they asked for it in a good way, and they got a, a good answer. They just have to warm up to the fact that this is a good thing and you know that this is a native american issue yes they're right but they forgot it involves their ancestors too who have come back to join them it is a native american issue and their and the native american ancestors too and so please let them in they are part of you and they are part of your process and don't let don't let the color of their skin dissuade you Gauge and, and uh, judge them by the color of their heart and their spirit, because that is the true way of, of being a Native American. We've, we, if you can, can remember, we used to in, invite, we used to adopt anyone who would accept our ways. And we must once again get back to that in order to make this, this thing go forward. And I know it's physically impossible to adopt all these people, but spiritually and socially we can adopt these people, and we should, and we must, because our survival depends on it, their survival depends on it. They're, you know, they're, they're coming back into a, into a world that they don't quite remember. There are some things about this new world that they, that they don't understand, and even we don't understand all that well, but we have to work together to move forward. Um, I guess it would be worthwhile also to ask about, um, about this movement for a, a new tribal nation. Um, I know we've talked about it in the past, and I don't want to, you know, divert our attention too much from our original plan, but it seems like now is a great time to maybe mention about One People Tribal Nation or the concept of perhaps creating a vehicle or a vessel to receive all these I alluded, people. I alluded, to that, American wave. I alluded yeah. to that earlier. I, when I said it is not physically possible for us to adopt all of these millions of ancestors that have come back into this world, into our tribes, because it's, it's physically impossible to do so. But yet we have to allow for them to live the way they want to live, which is basically our, our ways. And a vehicle for them to do that has to be created. And allowing for a new tribe 
is the way to do this. These are tribal people. As tribal people, they must have a tribe. So we must give them the opportunity and the vehicle to live tribally, and that is to allow the creation of a new tribe. And One People Tribal Nation addresses that. And hopefully other tribes with different names, the intention and the culture will be identical, but it will have different names. And that's a good thing. I mean, you know, uh, 512 recognized tribes in North America don't all have the same name. I mean, there's Lakota, there is Cherokee, there is Sioux, you know, there is all these other names. Well, one people tribal nation, and probably at one point, it'll be just be one people, one people nation or something like that. And there'll be the, uh, I don't know, the, the something, the something people or the, the and, and, and they will be tribal too, but we have to allow for them. We have to allow for them to form tribally and not, and not crush it while it's still delicate and, and it's in, in its infancy. In fact, it behooves Native America to support this effort and give guidance for guidance. Don't say, oh, you're doing that wrong. No. Here's how it's supposed to be done, or here's how you could do it better, even better. So it's not a criticism, but a guidance. This is, you know, this is a better way to um, to organize your your society, or this is a better way for you to practice your ceremonies, and using that tact to get these new tribes in in harmony and in order with the natural order of things, because they're still they're still struggling, and in fact. They're trying to do it the old ways. Well, these are new times, and the old ways have to be changed. Heck, even, even we have to change. A, a culture that is stagnant is a, is a culture that is dying. We are not an arrested culture. Prior to 1491, we borrowed a lot from each other, and we now have to keep growing that way, either by borrowing or innovating. And we must continue to do that. We cannot go back to 1491. Because if we do, then we have to start from that point forward. But we've learned a lot since that point in time. Let's keep moving it forward. And let's help those that want to be like us do it better. Does that answer it? That sounds like a great idea to me. Excellent. Um, <laughs> um, I would I would love to post some information about where people can learn more about all your different projects and whatever you want to share. So when we upload this video, we'll make sure to do that because I'm sure at this point there are people who are ready to jump through the screen and and uh, form a tribal nation somewhere or an eco village or you know whatever we want to call it. And in fact, actually at the spirit camp, um, it seems like an eco village is forming. And when I was there there are all these people working together as one community, you know, they're sharing one kitchen, they're sharing food, they're building, um, you know, they're building yurts together, they're talking about gardening, they're talking about permaculture, um, and it's this amazing magical place, you know. Yes, it's this like is the sharing of talking about. about. It's, it's not all about teepees yeah. now. Yeah, somebody added yurts, and then somebody added dome, tent, <laughs> dome tents and other right. and other things. Yes, we are we are moving moving forward, forward. Yes, and this is the way it's supposed to be. We're supposed to learn from each other, borrow from each other the good stuff, and you know, and keep the good stuff from our own ways, and maybe you know, tweak the whole thing. And but the the, the essence, the essence must be maintained, and the essence basically is living in harmony and balance with nature. Because after all, the, the, the most basic, the fundamental original instruction is survive. But you do not survive if you're stupidly living. You only survive if you are living in balance and harmony. So the survive sounds simple. But actually, if you expand it, it's quite difficult because you ha now have to survive in a good, balanced, harmonious way, which takes a whole lot of attention, awareness, and consciousness. Because th the current system is trying to survive. It, it, it too is on that. So it understands the word survive, but it's doing it stupid. 
in its effort to survive, it is destroying itself and us. We must not go that route. If we are survive, we must learn to survive smartly. We must learn to survive intelligently, consciously. We must survive in harmony and balance with nature. And the, the catchphrase is in, in, in the proper order of things or the natural order of things. We, that is something we have to grasp completely. We must grasp the natural order of things. That includes us. Is that it? Um, if, you, if you wouldn't mind addressing um, a little bit about consciousness, um, I think that you know, you started to get into that with the, the harmony and the order of things and, and nature. Um, but what is our right place in nature then? Uh, I mean, I know that we can't generalize all Native American philosophy, but if you could, or if you could present yours, then, you know, what is our right place? <laughs> our, our right place is observing our life and lifestyles so that it promotes life, so that it does not destroy. Uh, a beautiful phrase that I, I'm not sure where it comes from, maybe it's Greek or Roman, that's no, probably Greek, but it's do no harm. Right. That is something we have to, we have to learn. The, the current system doesn't seem to uh, understand that, that principle. It, 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 it says, well, we'll do, we'll do harm now and it'll be called collateral damage. We can fix it later. The truth is they just keep doing harm and, and every time they think they've got a fix, it just, it just perpetuates the harm or it, or it, it fixes one harm with, a, with, a, with another harm. And that is something that, that they have to get, that everybody has to get. Do no harm in the beginning. From the get-go, do no harm because you don't get a chance to fix it. There is no fix for harm. It's better to not, to not do it. So that's, that's, the, that's the basic principle. And then this thing about consciousness, well, consciousness is a, is a process. It is an evolution. Nobody is born conscious. It is a slow, gradual evolution, just like nobody is born an adult. It is something that comes as you move forward in time with the guidance of people that, have, that are and have, and have been good adults and, and learning from the, the ways that, 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 uh, that are around you from your own experiences. Consciousness can only move forward by a deliberate effort on your part to, to develop it. And the way Native America has developed their consciousness over the course of years is by observation and by ceremony. You have to do, you, consciousness is something you have to do uh, daily, or your, your promotion of consciousness. You have to daily wish to be a, a more conscious person. You have to ask for it. You have to do something that promotes it. Wake up in the morning and greet the sun. Thank Mother Earth for, every, for giving you another day. It doesn't sound like much, but, the, that, but those, two little, those two little things, they promote consciousness. They help consciousness grow. And it has to happen every day. Don't let it lapse because, you know, you can't gain consciousness in one day. It takes hundreds of days to promote consciousness and you just can't skip oh i'm only going to promote my consciousness on mondays and and friday and sunday no no it's yes that'll get it in a thousand years but you've only got you know less than a hundred so you know let's 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 do this every day so that maybe in your 50s maybe in your if you're really diligent in your 40s you'll be a conscious human being that can guide other up and coming human beings but it takes it takes daily effort and it takes wise effort do what those who have 
who have succeeded in it in the past have done and fit it to your circumstances and situations. But do it daily. That's it. That's it. Um, okay. Um, so I guess to wrap back around to the, the pipeline issue, um, that last question about uh, who does the pipeline benefit? And um, I don't know, you started to allude also to the fact that a lot of South American tribes, you know, I know the people in Ecuador, uh, lots of people have faced these pipeline issues. Um, where are we at in Native America with big money, big oil, um, and, and what's going on with this pipeline? Yes, South and Central America has faced issues with oil and oil extraction, not so much the pipelines, because over there they have, uh, they're, they're doing it in, in different ways, not so much with pipelines. But here in North America, pipelines are the fad of the moment. I'm going to read something that uh, I prepared prior, or I did some research prior to this conversation. I'm going to read it. Energy transfer, crude oil companies, the developers of the Dakota Access or Bakken oil pipeline asserts a public need for the 1,172 mile pipeline and promises jobs, tax revenues, and a boost to the economies of the affected states. Advocates are arguing against this pipeline. Its constructions have found that these claims are unfounded. Energy transfer bases its statement that the Dakota Access Pipeline is necessary on the business opportunity. Uh, let's see, on the business opportunities to get. Uh, let's see, on the uh, on the business opportunities to get more Bakken oil to market sooner, and not on any public need that would be served by a greater flow of oil from Dakota to Illinois. Now that's a it's a loaded statement there. It says its, it's really purpose is to get Bakken oil to market sooner. Now notice how it says, it doesn't say to get Bakken oil to market. It does not say to uh, get more, more oil to market. It says to get market to sooner and not on any public need that would be served by a greater flow of oil from Dakotas, from the Dakotas to the Illinois. And, that for, and not on any public need that would be served by the greater flow, the greater public need. Now that's, that's really key. Is there a greater public need? The company claims that farmers need the pipeline, this is a good one, to open up space to ship grain on trains that currently transport oil. That was, and of course, this was soundly debunked by expert witnesses and even by Iowa's utility board when they issued its approval for the project. They said, no, this is not true. We don't need extra space on the rails. We have enough rail space right now, even with the shipment of oil by rail, to move our product. There is no reason to believe that either the Midwest grain shipments will be curtailed in the future or that building the pipeline will reduce any rail shipping constraints that would arise. Now this was a finding, I didn't invent this. This was a finding by Elizabeth A. Stanton, a PhD and a nationally known expert in the economics of energy, environment, and equity, with more than 15 years experience in that field. Basically this person, an expert in the field, is saying, that there really is no compelling need for this pipeline, except maybe to get more oil to the market sooner. As if there, there was some kind of compelling need for it like yesterday. It's like how in the world is getting oil to us sooner really mitigate a situation that is not, is not really there. Yes, there are economics in this, but it is not for, what is that famous phrase here? The greater, the greater public need. The greater. In this, in the, using her, her phrase, yes. There is what, the greater public need is not being served by this. There is only a chance for a greater profit to the oil pipeline. This oil 
is going to get to us sooner or later. And there's nothing wrong with later. There is nothing, especially when later might actually be safer. And this is, and this is the, the, key, the key to all of this. Now, this oil. Now, this is something that we need to address. This oil. This oil that they're trying to move to us sooner is oil that has been extracted from the Balkan shale bed. Now, if that doesn't raise flags, nothing raises flags. See, this is not liquid oil that, that, they're, that they're going after. Yes, it's liquid in the pipe, but it wasn't liquid when they went after it. It is dirty oil that was extracted by a process known as fracking. Now, fracking has been analyzed and condemned most recently as a very, very bad way to extract oil. It is causing earthquakes. It's causing disruption of the, of the earth crust. And the worst part of this is that it creates pollution the likes we have never seen before. Now, oil and water don't mix. This is a good thing because down in the earth, the water and the oil keep their own levels. They don't intermix. So our water is water and it, and it doesn't mix with the oil and so we don't get oil in our water. And the oil stays, stays oil because it doesn't get any water into it. They just don't mix. However, fracking fluid and water do mix. These people are pumping fracking fluids, a solvents into the shale and bringing back up an oil and fracking fluid mixture that allows the, this congealed oil to be fluid enough to flow down their pipes. But see, they don't recover all of the fracking fluid. And fracking fluid mixes with water. Down in the earth now, we have this fluid that would mix with water getting into our water system, the, the very purest of our waters, the aquifers, and mixing with it. So pretty soon we're gonna be pumping water tainted by fracking fluid because it mixes. Yes, the oil and the water don't mix, and that's, you know, that's a good thing. But oil and fracking fluid, they mix, and they don't make a very tasty cocktail. They make a very dangerous cocktail. So this is something that needs to be considered. Do we really need oil so bad? Or do we really need energy so bad that we would risk drinking contaminated water? I mean, after all, all oil really is, it's energy. It's not the only source of energy. Yes, it is the most currently popular source of energy, and it is right now the easiest energy to use, but that doesn't make it the best for us now. Maybe back when you could just dro drop a pipe into an oil pool and pull straight oil out, it was fine because there was no fracking fluids involved. There was no dangerous chemicals being put into the mix. Now there are dangerous chemicals going into the mix that can pollute our water. And speaking of pollution, what about the land? What about the land that's being polluted? I mean, we know, let's see here. I have a little piece on that. Um, oh, let's see here, blah, 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 fluid on international pipe, no three million transporting all by its, ah! A study by the International Agency found that U.S. pipelines spill, now this is, this is good, spill three times as much crude oil as trains. This was from a study from 2004 to 2012. Even though pipeline accidents happen less frequency than, frequently than train accidents, a fact is that some people, this is a fact that some people used to argue that transporting oil by pipeline is safer than rail. They can, they can be larger, These, the, the pipeline spills can be larger and more difficult to clean up. 
pipeline spills happen nearly, now this is a, star, a staggering statistic, nearly every day in the US. Did you know that? No, you didn't know that. But if you poked into it, you'd find out there is almost one pipeline spill every day in the US. Federal data shows, this has been show, uh, discovered by Richard Stover, again a PhD for the Center of Biological Diversity. The, the, environment, uh, the environmental assessment didn't address what damage a Dakota access leak could cause. Now, pipelines, they run through farmlands and usable lands. Now, railroads, when the, a railroad car derails and spills some oil, it's usually on, on land that has been already accessed for a generation or generations only for commercial use. Nobody has ever planted along a railway. But pipelines go under farmlands. And when there's a spill, there is a large quantity of farm land which we need and is not replaceable pulled out of the system. This is not a good situation because you cannot make arable land. So a pipeline leak is more damaging to the environment than a rail car spill. And this is something that was not, as the man uh, Richard Stover says, this was not taken into consideration when they did the environmental assessment of the pipeline. So this is this is an, an amazing this is an amazing issue that that has to be brought to the forefront. Now, gosh, what am I'm going to go back to my to my other notes here? Uh, the 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 process. The process that they have used. Say hi. Hi. Hello. Having fun yet? We're recording a video. Cool. <laughs> Excellent. Happy okay. Halloween. All right. Uh -huh. I'm going to get back. I'm going to put my serious face back on. Okay. Farmland cannot be sued, cannot be seized through eminent domain in the state, attorneys said, unless it is for a project with a public benefit. Notice the thing, public benefit, like a oh, highway so or school that line. it was a public benefit. Now, the use of eminent domain is being used in this pipeline for a private industry, not a public benefit. I mean, where is the public benefit? I mean, certainly... There is none. Yeah, the, 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 the people in... In North Dakota, the the, uh, the 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 Sioux tribe is not receiving any benefit from from this from the condemnation of this land of this eminent domain taking. So they're they're not getting any benefit. The farmers and the ranchers, well, they're obviously not getting anything because their eminent domain was used to take land away from them. Oh yes, they were given fair market value. But you know what? That's not a real benefit. Fair market value is not a benefit. So there is no, there is no public benefit. It's all private benefit that's being pushed here in this situation. So what it looks like is eminent domain is used to force landowners to sell land that energy transfer partners needs to build their pipeline. But it's who look who's benefiting? Energy transfer partners, not not right. the farmers who have lost their land to eminent domain. So uh, again, th this is a clear violation of of the the natural no the legal and lawful way of things, and you know that's not right either. The U.S. Corps of uh, Army Corps of Engineers subjected the pipeline to what's called the Nationwide Permit Twelve process and narrowly looked at several, now narrowly looked at several hundred waterway crossings, essentially as independent projects, okay? I'll further explain. Okay. Rather than judging it as one massive structure. Now the director of the Army Corps of Engineers says, this permit program was designed for small structures like boat ramps and mooring buoys that affected fewer than half an acre of the Corps' jurisdiction. But these guys are using that permitting process for this project, which is massive, 
affects a larger body of, of people and land and is not really covered in that in the Army Corps of Air Engineers jurisdiction on permit on permit permitting this process. So this is just this is just fall from the get go. There is it's all a mess. So, yes, yeah. there is some real legal issues involved in this, not just the moral and uh, and survival issues that are that are up, up for grabs, but there are some some serious legal issues that need to be addressed in this in a in a good responsible way. And I'm just wondering, um, how is it that they've gotten away with not really addressing these things? I still haven't been able to figure out. How did they wriggle through all of this by just oh. bullying their way through, bribing people in the government? I mean, what could possibly have happened? And it was by carefully focusing uh, people's attention on different things. Like, the, I'm sure the pipelines used uh, this this uh, permitting process they, as as the way to do. They they're they're. Their legal people looked at this process and said, you know, this is a very lightweight process. It doesn't look real deeply into the, into the, greater, uh, the greater ramifications of things. Let's bring this to the attention of the Army Corps of Engineers, point out that they have this process, and then let's apply for our project under this process. The Corps of Engineers, of course, gets completely blindsided and says, oh, yes, we do have this process. You know what? Uh, yeah, why not? Let's, right. run it. Let's run it under this process without thinking, wait a minute, this is not a really good fit. But by just pressing the issue that there's this process, there's this process, let's run it this way, please run it this way, you know, we got to hurry up, this is very critical, blah, 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 you know, do this, this is, this is fast, this will save you tons of hours and, and work, and, and, this is, and this is a great way to do it. And the army says, "Oh yeah, 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 yeah. No, let's yeah, let's do it easy." But the easy way in this case is not the right way and not a good way. And the Army Corps of Engineers, in fact, actually now with the protests, has been forced to revisit this issue. Otherwise, I wouldn't have known about it. And so we oh, wow. we have to force the fact we have to force the issue. Say, look at this, Army Corps of Engineers. You used a process to approve this that really isn't specific for this type of for this for this. Let's go back and use the appropriate process. So who who do we put pressure on to to leverage? I mean, I know people are calling the White House and leaving silly recordings. I, I'm sure that's not really working. I know Bernie wrote a letter to Obama saying, "Come on, let's do this." Department of Justice asked them to stop. Um, and they haven't stopped. So who do we go to now? Okay. The Army Corps of Engineers has to approve anything that gets done. Once, okay. once these people either give it the go or the no-go, that is, that is the final word on this. No, the president can only suggest to his to the Army Corps of Engineers, who was given the authority to make these decisions, and it cannot be taken away without a whole lot of trouble. They're the ones in charge. They're the ones that, that give it the green light. And they're just an agency of the government, but they are a very powerful agency, and they're the ones that make the final decision. Really, the Army Corps of Engineers can green light or red light this thing based on their on their evaluation. It is, it, again, important to point out that they use the wrong process to give this a goal, a, a green light. So we have to continue pushing the fact to go back to the proper way of doing this thing. And we'll probably, they'll probably find out that this project doesn't, pa doesn't pass muster. In fact, actually, this is really funny. The, the pipeline people know that there's, there's trouble in the process because a previous crossing at north of Bismarck was scrapped on the grounds right. that it threatened the North Dakota capital's water supply. Okay. They said, oh, my gosh. But how it might is it threatens the Indians' water supply? Oh, right? yeah, of course. But it's all, oh, well, let's move it a little further south where it doesn't threaten the capital's water supply, where it threatens... Some non, uh, some non entities known as uh, the Sioux people. 
you know, with uh, and threatens their water. <laughs> That's but, horrible. You know, but you know, they're they're not going to raise a fuss. Of course, they are going to raise a fuss, and right. they did raise a fuss, and they should have raised a fuss. But you know what's really sad is they deferred to the capital of North Dakota. They deferred to Bismarck and said, "Oh no, we cannot pollute Bismarck's water." Let's move it further south and pollute the rest of the nation's water. Because honestly, if, if that pipe ruptures, even south of Bismarck, that water, that pollution goes directly into the Missouri River, which goes into the Mississippi River, which, which is the water source for millions, I mean, tens of millions of people. But no, we can't pollute the water for Bismarck. But, you know, let's quietly pollute the water of the rest of, uh, of the, the entire central part of, of, of the United States. Because nobody's going to notice because there's nobody out there to raise a fuss except maybe these Indians. And, and you know what? And, they, and who listens to them anyway? Well, <laughs> it's, it's time we start listening, especially those people who actually drink the water out of the Missouri River, that drink the water out of the Mississippi River, they, you better get, you better get, you know, you better get your, uh, your, your game in gear because otherwise, you know, you're going to get polluted because, why? Because Bismarck didn't want their water polluted. Although the truth is, if Bismarck's water got polluted, the same scenario, everybody downstream is water is going to get polluted. But no, 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 no. Uh, there's no there's no chance of that. Uh, there's no chance of water being polluted, in spite of the fact that there is an oil pipeline failure every day in the United States. Every day. Every day. And and somehow that didn't get factored into the environmental assessment. And to add to that, um, in my interview with John Ballenbaugh last week, I found out that these pieces of pipe are being made in China and they're being stamped as Canadian steel, but they're not. And it's a type of metal that can't hold a weld. So there are all these little pinhole leaks constantly and the welds can't be made properly. So it's definitely not a question of if there's gonna be a spill, it's when, and when is right away from day one. That's what he said. There is, no compelling, there is no compelling reason for this pipeline. In fact, with all, with all of this information presented, actually there is a compelling reason for there not to be the pipeline. If anything, this, if they really need to sell oil from the Balkan shale, they really need to move it in a safer way. And like I said, it is probably safer to have a train car spill than it is to have a pipeline spill because a train car only holds a couple thousand gallons of oil. So much, yeah. But a pipeline can spew in a very, very short time millions of gallons of oil and, and in the process take out perfectly arable land that can never ever be replaced. Like the, the, a, rail, a railroad area can certainly be, you know, scooped up and, and new, new track put in and uh, you know it, it, right. it, it's a lot more it, it's a lot more controllable but you cannot you cannot scoop up you know 10 acres of farmland and and then put new new land in its place I'm sorry you that's just that just can't be done it, 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 where are you going to get 10 acres of arable land to replace the 10 acres that got destroyed you cannot and that is, goes back to something I said earlier, the natural order of things or one of the basic, one of the basic principles or what I'm going to call the original instructions should be do no harm in the, in the first place. And don't do anything that might do harm, that has the potential of doing harm. It's better to, to be moved forward safe, safely than to be sorry later because Sorry doesn't fix damage. Okay. Uh, any other questions? 
Um, hopefully I can get a phone number or uh, some type of contact information for the Army Corps of Engineers now that we've kind of figured out that they're the ones that we need to put the pressure on. Um, you know, I can't think of anything else, and I think we've probably reached our time limit. Do you know how far into this we are? Uh, no, I don't have a clock on my on my side. Do you have one on your side? I know. It's not showing me a clock on, on my um, side either, so I'm going to assume that we're about 30 minutes into this. Um, oh, it's close enough. I, close I enough. Would Actually, I think I think more we, I think we have uh, we've put most of what we need to. Unless you have a really compelling question that needs to be answered, uh, I really don't see the point of moving forward. There's only just one thing. Um, just do you think that um, an oil spill presents a, a health risk for the people in the surrounding areas? Wow. Yes, an oil spill creates uh, a health risk. Again, let's look at the oil that's being used. I mean, oil itself contains a lot of, uh, of chemistry in it. Some of them are, you know, crude oil contains um, some of the solvents that we use, like the, some of the ketones and some of the benzene and all these things are naturally occur in raw oil. And those things are extracted when it's turned into motor oil and gasoline and all that, and it's, they're, they're put aside. Thing. But raw oil contains all these hazardous things. So when there's an oil spill, those toxic chemicals are released. And if they're released into the ground, well, th that's a really bad thing because now that, gr that ground has to be isolated and put into some kind of a storage until, until the natural evolution of things, you know, somehow, you know, it will decay or degenerate and it'll, and, and it'll become, you know, it'll be consumed by the natural process of degradation. But it's a, it's a very slow process. And in the meantime, these toxic substances are being inhaled, ingested, and otherwise going into the bodies of people in the surrounding area. So yes, it's very, uh, an oil spill is a very dangerous, is a very dangerous thing. And detrimental to uh, human health and, and our survival. Right. All right. Well, um, I think we've covered a lot of ground. Um, I, I'd love to do another interview about other things another time. And uh, it's really exciting to have had the chance to talk to you as an expert on a lot of these different issues. And um, gosh. I'm glad I was given the opportunity to, to put something forward into this process because uh, this is, you know, this, in, this, this is my survival too. I mean, you know, right. I know the pipeline doesn't go, doesn't go right past my homeland, but you know, if the aquifer, if the aquifer that I drink from is contaminated, well, my gr children's grandchildren's health is directly affected. I actually would like my people to move forward. I would like my people to see the future. I would like them to enjoy these things that I have enjoyed. I would like them to see summers. I would like them to see winters. I would like them to enjoy the dances that we do. I would like them to enjoy the ceremonies that we do. And if the water that they drink is toxic, they're not going to have that chance. And so I am compelled to do something to preserve this future. Excellent. I agree. <laughs> um, well, if that's all we've got, then I'll say thank you very much. And it's been a privilege and an honor to speak with you. And I for now, right? And blessings and beauty too. Blessings and beauty. Bye for now. Bye for now.